you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. We're going to use this as our starting text this morning. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. And if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word as we look at this one verse of Scripture from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. He says in verse 27, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This issue of standing together in one accord for the cause of Christ is a common issue in all of Paul's letters to the various churches that he wrote to that we have in the canon of Scripture. He addressed the issue of unity among the congregation in all of these various churches. Now, one thing i point out just real quickly is that we in our world sometimes conflate unity and uniformity, and they're not the same thing. Uniformity means everybody dresses the same, looks the same, acts the same, thinks the same, does the same. That's why we call people who wear uniforms, you know, and you can identify they all are on the same team because they all look alike because they all have the same uniform. Uniformity is about replicating the same product over and over and over and over again to where everything is exactly the same. That is not what unity is. God could have created, created us all exactly alike. He could have created everybody just like me and for your sakes, I'm so glad he did. <laughs> God created us to verse on purpose. Unity is the idea that we as diverse individuals can come together harmoniously in agreement and accord with one another, setting our differences aside and rallying together around a greater and common calling and purpose. We don't all have to agree on every little issue. We don't all have to share the exact same doctrine on secondary and tertiary issues. But when it comes to the big things, like Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose from the grave three days later, conquered sin and death, bought our pardon, and in Him and in Him alone can we have salvation, that's the big thing. And we need to be unified around that and not quabble and fight and strive with one another. That's an issue we're going to deal with in the morning sermon in Corinthians. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to be in your house. I pray that in these next few moments, God, you would open our eyes, our hearts, and our ears to the things that you have for us. That we may encounter you in this place this morning just as sure as we have encountered one another. And that we may walk out of here confidently knowing we've been in your presence, we've heard from you, and as a result, we are changed by the power of your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you're being seated, you can turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Kind of mark your spot there. That's going to be our main text this morning. As you may recall, last week... We began a new sermon series. So if you missed last week, that's okay. You're still getting in right on the front end of this thing. We're excited. Over the next several months, we are going to work our way systematically through Paul's letters to Corinth, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. We have titled this series, The Messed Up Church. Paul's letters to to Corinth. And as I said last week, I borrowed that name, The Messed Up Church, from a popular podcast that my son listens to every week. But the premise of the podcast, The Messed Up Church, is to go through and lovingly 
not, not accusatory, not, not condemning, but lovingly point out many of the errors, both practically and, theor and, and, and theo theologically, there's the word, that are present within the modern church. Because the fact is, there are problems prevalent in the modern church, and there were problems in the church in Corinth, in the New Testament church. And we need to identify those issues, and we need to talk about those issues, and we need to address those issues in accordance with Scripture, so that we might become the church that God desires for us to be. I'm so excited about what God has in store for us over these next several weeks as we dig into God's Word and apply it to our lives individually and corporately as His church. Last Sunday in our opening message, we looked at the salutation or the greeting, the first nine verses of First Corinthians in which Paul uh, introduces himself as the author of the letter and sends his greetings from himself and uh, his colleague Sosthenes there in verse 1 to the Christians at Corinth. In those opening verses, you may recall, he expressed thanksgiving to God for them because they've been a blessing to his life. And he encourages them by stating that God is faithful and that in Christ they will someday stand blameless before him on the day of the Lord. That is a remarkable statement when you consider what the theme of this letter and the, and the content of this letter is going to contain. One by one by one, we're going to address doctrinal issues that they're having at this church. We're going to address practical things that they're doing wrong at this church. We're going to identify problem after problem after problem that are plaguing this congregation and are prevalent in other places as well. And yet he introduces his letter by saying, Someday, regardless of all this nonsense, you will stand blameless before the Lord. It's a bold declaration of what Christ's blood and righteousness does for broken us. <laughs> We're a messed up church. But he's not a messed up savior. Praise the Lord. And so following this warm greeting, verses 1 through 9, Paul begins the lengthy content of his letter, which is going to go all the way through the opening verses of chapter 16, in which one by one he is going to address issue after issue after issue that are having a detrimental effect on the Corinthian church. And the very first of these issues, which is the topic of today's message, is division among the congregation. In fact, that's the title of today's sermon. Division among the congregation. Now, while our main text and our study is on 1 Corinthians, I want to begin today just by marking your spot there and turn back with me to Acts chapter 18 for just a few minutes. If you recall, in our opening sermon last week, we spent a significant amount of time in Acts chapter 18 because Acts chapter 18 details the latter portion of Paul's second missionary journey when he arrived at Corinth and established the church at Corinth to which now he is writing in 1 Corinthians. We learned that Paul came to Corinth near the end of the second missionary journey that he stayed there for a year and a half. And that while he was there, he lived with a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And they were tent makers. And we learned that during the 18 months that he was there, a congregation was established and a new church was established. And when Paul left the city of Corinth to return home, Aquila and Priscilla went with him. All of this is detailed in chapter 18 we discussed last week. But before we leave all of that, I want to read the end of this chapter as well as we look at our first point this morning, which is called Other Prominent Preachers. There on your outline. Other Prominent Preachers 
Starting in Acts chapter 18, verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. The man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And so, as we read last week, when Paul left the city of Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla went with him. Now, Paul was wrapping up this second missionary journey, and he was traveling home to his home church in Antioch. But as he was making his way home from Corinth, he made a brief stop in a couple of places, just quickly. One of those places was Ephesus, and we read last week that Aquila and Priscilla stayed in Ephesus, and Paul went on without them. Now today we are reading that while Paul was at home, a young man arrives in Ephesus. Well, Aquila and Priscilla are now there. And this young man is a dynamic preacher. And he begins speaking in the synagogue about Jesus. He has been taught and learned of, the, learned of Jesus, and he is speaking there in Ephesus in the synagogue about the Lord Jesus Christ. However, this young man, who, by the way, was named Apollos, Scripture tells us he was a Jew from the city of Alexandria, which is in northern on the northern uh, African continent. He was passionate. He was persuasive. He was a dynamic pastor. But his understanding of Christ's baptism was lacking. It says there that he... Speaks beautifully and accurately, but verse 25, he was only acquainted with the baptism of John. What does that mean? Well, John baptized with water. But the scripture says Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. What does that mean? That means the baptism of Christ is talking about a spiritual baptism. It is talking about a regeneration. It is talking about new life. Whereas the baptism of John is merely a symbolic gesture. <laughs> baptism in water. And so Aquila and Priscilla heard Apollo speaking. They thought, man, <laughs> he's a gifted young speaker. He's, he's very good. But his preaching is incomplete. And so they pulled him aside, Scripture says, and they taught him the way of God, verse 26, more accurately. They filled in some blanks. And once they were comfortable, and once Apollos was prepared, it says that he was sent, he went on to the city of Corinth. He moved on. They, Aquila and Priscilla, gave him a letter sent him to the church, which, by the way, they had just recently left. So they knew who Aquila and Priscilla were. Letters of accommodation, if you will. He shows up. It says the congregation greets him, welcomes him, and over the time that Apollos was there in Corinth, he proved to be a great help to uh, the Corinthian believers. He publicly refuted the Jews, just as Paul, just as Paul had done when he was there and convincingly demonstrated through the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And we can be certain that as a result of Apollos' ministry there in Corinth, 
the church continued to grow as he built, as he continued to build on that which Paul had started. Now, the Bible does not give us all of the details of Peter's missionary journeys. But we do know that Peter also went on missionary journeys, as did many of the disciples after Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension into heaven. They dispersed and they went out preaching the gospel in various places across the known world. The Bible doesn't give us all the details regarding these things, but we can say with confidence that Peter also traveled from town to town, just like Paul did, just like Apollos did, just like others, proclaiming the kingdom of God, evangelizing, and planting new churches and or strengthening existing churches in the various places he went. And most historians believe that the apostle Peter also visited the church in Corinth. Perhaps around the same time that Apollos was there, or perhaps shortly thereafter. Now, knowing what we know about Peter, it is likely that he had a particular appeal to the Jewish Christians there in the congregation. This was a congregation of mostly Gentile believers. However, there were some Jewish believers present there also. And if you remember, Peter had a propensity at times to kind of carry some of his old Judaism into his new Christianity. He had a kind of a hard time letting go of some of his Jewish roots and some of the laws and some of the rules and some of the things that he was used to and the traditions. He had a hard time of separating those two things sometimes which I trust that many of the Jews, those who had grown up in Judaism, were having a hard time adjusting to the liberties allowed them, not for sin, but just the, the less rigorous demands that grace was teaching them in Christianity. So I would imagine Peter had appealed to uh, those Jewish believers that struggled with the same issues that he struggled with. Nevertheless, his preaching and teaching grew the church even more. Now, go with me back, now that we have that backdrop, back to 1 Corinthians. The second point this morning is called misguided division. Misguided division. Now, if you've been listening this morning, what you have heard is rather remarkable. Not because I said it, because of the content. <laughs> Think about this. The church at Corinth, within the span of about, I don't know, three, four years, had for its first three preachers, Paul, <laughs> Apollos, and Peter. Three of the greatest evangelists, three of the greatest missionaries of all time, all within a relatively short period of time, present and teaching at the Church of Corinth. I mean, a modern day equivalent would be like having, you know, a, 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 a Billy Graham, I know he's no longer with us, but a Billy Graham and a, a John MacArthur and, and who knows, a, some other great problem, uh, this week Charles Stanley passed away. We'll say Charles Stanley. Three great preachers. Let's use a Baptist preacher. Adrian Rogers, there you go. Now we're talking, right? Three just huge, huge names. All three in the same pulpit within just a couple of years span. You would think that, you couldn't beat that. But, <laughs> even though it is, it is without question, all three of these men contributed to the ministry, all three of these men were dynamic speakers, all three of these men likely led many people to Jesus Christ, 
and they joined the church, and the church of Corinth began to grow and prosper as a result of their me uh, respective ministries. Nevertheless, the presence of these notable preachers led to division among the congregation and the formation of differing factions. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Read with me here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, that's Peter, and I'm of Christ. Has Christ been divided? I'm going to stop right there for just a minute. You see, there was division in the church. All of these dynamic preachers had been there. All of them had been used of God to do great things while they were there. The church was growing and bustling, but apparently... Apparently, there was some confusion within the church that was leading to division. And let me address that issue just real quick. It's expounded on a little bit more in the verses we're going to read in just a moment. But let me just give it to you. I mentioned it just a while ago. It appears that at least to some degree, the Corinthian believers were confused about the purpose and the effect of water baptism. Now, this is not a sermon about water baptism, per se. That's not, we're not going to dig through all the scriptures on that. But let me just tell you, the Bible teaches, and we have talked about it before, specifically, that water baptism is purely symbolic. It is a visible depiction of an invisible truth. And that is regeneration. Regeneration is the new birth that occurs within the heart of a sinner when they repentantly accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Regeneration, to be generated again, to be born again. Jesus talked to Nicodemus about you must be born again. You must pass from spiritual death to spiritual life. You must be made alive. You must be quickened in the spirit. This is regeneration. It is the baptism of Jesus. The idea that you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in your life and affects salvation and regeneration in your life so that you were formerly dead, but now you are alive. You were dead in your sins and trespasses, but now you are alive in Christ because you have accepted him as your Lord and your Savior. Beloved, water baptism doesn't save anybody. Water baptism is merely a public declaration of a inward reality and it shows and declares publicly that you have been saved. And that you want to proclaim that salvation visibly to the world. Unfortunately, it seems that many of the Christians in Corinth, and by the way, many today, equated water baptism with salvation. Now follow me here. Because they equated water baptism with salvation, many of them were inclined then to take the next step, which would be the person who baptized me saved me. Because they thought that being baptized was what was saving them. And so they, they had this, this mistaken idea, at least to some degree, that the person who actually baptized them in the water was at least in part responsible for their salvation. Or maybe not necessarily the person who baptized them, 
but the person who led them to be baptized, to make that decision. And as a result of this flawed thinking, we see that they were identifying themselves rigidly with the various pastors who had been there over the last few years who had done or led them to be baptized. And some were saying, I am of Paul. And others were saying, I am of Apollos. And still others were saying, I am of Cephas, I am of Peter. Notice there were some in the congregation who had their theology correct. And were saying, I am of Christ. That's what they should have all been saying. But they weren't. And thus, there was division. Paul urged the Corinthian believers to put aside their disputes. He had been informed, apparently, from one of the members of the congregation, verse 11, a woman named Chloe. She had sent word to Paul saying that this division existed within the congregation and he is writing to try to deal with it. And he's saying you need to come together and be of one mind and of the same judgment. And he asked them a question. He says, is Christ divided? He doesn't answer the question because the answer is obvious. Is Christ divided? No. Christ is not divided. In fact, in another one of his letters where he addressed this same issue, I mentioned a while ago, he addressed this issue of unity with all of his letters, in all of his letters. But if you look at the letter particularly that he wrote to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and through 6, it's very insightful as we talk about this. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. Paul is urging them to accept and understand that as the church, as the followers of Christ, as believers, they are to be united. Jesus is not divided. They should not be divided either. Later on in this letter, he is going to elaborate at length about a metaphoric concept the Bible teaches, Paul presents, called the body of Christ. We are all members of his body, one body. We should be unified. They had misguided division. Well, let's look at our third and final point this morning. A preacher's anonymity. A preacher's anonymity. We're going to pick up right there in the middle of verse 13 where we stopped. Paul had just asked if Christ is divided. He's going to continue with a few more questions. Here we go. Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. But beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross would be made void. Paul went on to ask the Corinthian church if it was he who had been crucified for them. Was it me who hung on the cross and died for you? Paul says. Was it me who was raised from the dead? Was it me who ascended from the Mount of Olives into heaven? Was it me? He then asked, had they been baptized in his name? 
Again, he doesn't answer the question because the answers are obvious. No! Paul didn't die on the cross for them. By the way, neither did Apollos. Neither did Peter. Neither did anybody else for that matter. It was just Jesus. Jesus was the only one. Were they baptized in the name of Paul? No! Elsewhere in Scripture, we read of actual baptisms that took place. They were baptized in Jesus' name. When we baptize somebody today, we, need, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't baptize them in the name of the preacher. We don't baptize them in the name of whoever it was that led them to the Lord, their father, their mother, their grandfather, their Sunday school teacher. No, they baptized in the name of Jesus. It was Jesus who was crucified on the cross of Calvary to atone for sin. They had been baptized in his name. Beloved, neither Paul, nor Apollos, nor Peter were responsible for their salvation. These guys, as prominent as they were, <laughs> as well known as they were, as famous as they were, and even continue to be in Christianity 2,000 years later. Paul, who wrote almost half the New Testament, Peter, who wrote or was responsible for the content of the Gospel of Mark and 1st and 2nd Peter, Apollos, who may well have written the book of Hebrews, we don't have many people that we can think of that are more dynamic and big than these figures in Christianity. And yet Paul is resistant to the idea that anybody would say that they are of him or anybody else for that matter that's not Jesus. You're of Jesus. We're simply servants of God of mine. You see, Paul was uncomfortable. And Paul was some, somewhat uh, disenchanted with the idea that some of these Corinthian believers were ascribing their allegiance and their devotion to him rather than to God. In fact, Paul says in these verses, that he was thankful that he only baptized a few people while he was in corn. He was thankful that he had only baptized Crispus and Gaius and, and the household of Stephanus and maybe a few others he couldn't remember, but not that many. Why was he thankful he hadn't baptized very many people? Because had he baptized more of them, he might have further perpetuated this problem. He might have further aggravated this idea that somehow he was responsible for their salvation. Listen, Paul wasn't trying to minimize the significance of baptizing people. We need, we need ministers and we need um, leaders and we need parents and, and godly people to baptize other people. It's a beautiful symbolic uh, declaration. And it's an important ordinance within the context of the church. But it doesn't save the person. And Peter's saying, I don't want anybody saying that I was responsible for their salvation because Jesus was the one that was responsible for their salvation. I feel uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable being equated even in the slightest iota with Jesus. Because the bottom line is, I'm not Jesus. I'm not even close to Jesus. Even on my best day, I'm not even in the same conversation as Jesus. He said, I wasn't called to baptize people. I was rather called to preach the gospel. To proclaim the name of Jesus. 
I was called to make Jesus famous. I was called to lift up his name. It's not about me at all. It's wholly about him. And my calling was to preach the gospel in sincerity and in truth. I love it in verse 17. This is such an important verse for me personally. Not in cleverness of speech. In other words, not with some silver slit tongue. Paul said, I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to preach from my heart in simplicity, in sincerity, so that I can know for certain that those who listen and receive the gospel were not drawn by the charismatic tongue of a slit-talking preacher, but rather by the appeal and the power of the cross. You see, Paul humbly rejected celebrity status. He didn't want it. He desired instead to remain as lowly and as unassuming as he possibly could be. Beloved, I suspect we all have a pastor or preacher or Sunday school teacher or Bible study leader or, or family member, someone that we hold in a special place in our heart because they were instrumental in praying for us, in loving us, and ultimately in teaching us about Jesus and our need for Him. I know that my mother's father, my, my granddaddy, my people, He's my, he's my spiritual hero. He was a pastor, and, and since the time I was little, I was at church, Pete Ball's church. I grew up listening to his sermons. He's a man that I've always aspired to be like as far as a human being is concerned. I suppose we all have somebody or somebody's that are like that. But I can tell you this. If I could talk to Pete Paul today, I am confident that he would say, as I am saying to you now, and as Paul was saying here, that we should never attribute that which belongs to God alone to any other person. Jesus is worthy of all glory all praise, all honor, all devotion, all allegiance. And those pastors or leaders who accept such a claim and such adoration from their congregations or from the culture or from the world should be ashamed of themselves. Beloved, the pastor's role is to make Jesus famous, not themselves. pastor's role is to teach believers to lean completely on Jesus and not on anyone else. Can I tell you, quite honestly, when you're going through a struggle, when you're going through a difficulty, when you're going through a challenge, when you're facing obstacles, hey, I, I can be there and I want to be there and I'm not saying that, that I don't want to be there. Sometimes I don't even know. Other times, I, I'm, I'm limited. Other times, I'm just stupid. Why? Because I'm a fallen, frail human being just like you are. And apart from God's grace, I, I am destined for hell and I'm wretched, unrighteous, filthy as rags. But here's the good news. You don't need me. You need Jesus. Talk to Him. Rely on Him. Lean on Him. We need Jesus. That's who we need. Well, let me close our message this morning with a few minutes that we have left. 
Three big issues that we touched on in these few verses we talked about this morning. Number one, the Christian church should not be needlessly divided. We shouldn't quarrel or be contentious with one another. This behavior misrepresents Jesus. And we are called to be Jesus' ambassadors and representatives on the earth. We're not Jesus, but we should aspire to live in a way that represents Jesus to the world around us. And when we argue and fight and quabble over stupid things that have no significance whatsoever, we misrepresent and disparage Jesus' holy name. Shame on us. Instead, we should be of one mind and one judgment. My friends, if we are ever to be the church that God calls us and desires us to be, we must begin by coming together in agreement as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why this is the very first issue he addresses. We're not going to get to any of the other issues until we first get rid of the division and we come together with one heart and one mind. So that we can, in a unified front, address all of these other problems. Number one, no division. Number two, we have to understand that water baptism doesn't bring about salvation. It merely symbolizes that which Christ has affected in the heart of a new believer. New Christians are baptized as a public expression and declaration of their salvation. And thereby they identify themselves with Christ and with his church. Water baptism is merely a physical illustration of a spiritual reality. And then third, we must learn to follow and rely on Christ, Christ alone. He is the one who saves us. He is the one who sustains us in our darkest hours. There is no other besides Him. Beloved, it doesn't matter how godly your pastor is. He is a vile, wretched sinner saved by grace, just like everyone else who has trusted in Jesus for salvation. Paul said, don't conflate me with Jesus. It makes me uncomfortable. He was right. My friends, if your faith is dependent upon your pastor, or on anyone else for that matter, it is gravely misplaced. Don't place your pastor on a pedestal, because he is unworthy to be there. And beloved, if he's worth his salt, he doesn't want to be there either. That spot's reserved for Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today and this opportunity, Lord, to open your word. I pray, God, that as you've expounded this to us, myself included, that I've just been a, a, a mouthpiece for whom and through whom you have, have spoken. God, I pray that we learn to ascribe all glory and honor to you and you alone. And God, that we learn to lean on you and to rest in you, to cast our burdens upon you. God, I pray that you would remove any division from among us and help us, though each of us is different and each of us is unique and beautiful in your created uh, vision. God, help us to be able to come together as brothers and sisters and family in Christ. And to work together harmoniously for the cause of the gospel. So that your church might be advanced in this place. That your name might be glorified. And that you might receive all honor and acclaim that is due. God, I pray that if there are any decisions to be made this morning... During this brief time of invitation, whatever you've laid on the hearts of these folks that are gathered here today, that they would respond in obedience to you during our invitation. 
For we ask it in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. 